Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I am Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries in programs like this. We'd like to thank the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith, whose generous support made this episode of Lunch Break Science possible. Here with us today is Leakey Foundation Baldwin Fellowship Scholar and Research Grant recipient, Dag Mohui Gedohun. Um, Dag, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. That's, I'm really excited. It's a great way to, to end, end this month. I don't, I don't know. Um, anyway, <laughs> Dag is joining us from New York, where she is a biological anthropology PhD candidate at the Graduate Center of the City of Uni uh, City University of New York. Sorry, that was like a mouthful. Um, <laughs> um, she's also adjunct lecturer at the Lerman Lehman College um, and mentor at, for high school students at the American Museum of Natural History. She's also one of the organizers of the Black Bioanth Group. Um, her research takes her to fossil sites all over the world, uh, including the Homa Peninsula of Kenya, and um, here's a little image of one of her sites, a little sneak peek preview. Um, and also to the uh, RC region of Ethiopia to look at wild gelata habitats. So one of the, um, the gorgeous photos from the, her site there. So today we'll be exploring the evolution of gelata monkeys and their ancestors. Before we get started, if you're watching us live on YouTube, Facebook, Leaky Foundation Live, or Twitter, you can submit questions for Dag anytime in the chat, and she will be answering those questions at the end of the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely she'll be able to answer them. Also, we will be having a quiz for you a little later, so be sure to uh, be ready to type your answers in the chat as well. So, Dag, we usually hear about you know, fossils of human ancestors or the behavior of monkeys that are alive today. Why don't really we really ever hear about the fossils of monkey ancestors? Um, I, I actually think it's because of a number of reasons. Um, so the first is um, in terms of human evolution, you know, uh, being humans ourselves, we're always interested to know more about, you know, like our own evolutionary history, how we came to be, what was happening uh, in the past. Uh, and also uh, most, you know, mainstream media outlets usually report on human evolution. So that's what a lot of um, people outside of the field get knowledge of. Um, and in terms of primate, um, non-human primate evolution, uh, for a long time, there haven't been that many people studying it. Um, there's, you know, individuals here and there. Um, but nowadays, I think um, it's a growing field and more people are getting into it. And hopefully, you know, we <laughs> get a little bit more of the shine <laughs> with human evolution as well. Yeah, I was, I was just, it was making me think there's not a, like a gelata gazette where the gelatas read about their own ancestry with new finds, but um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, it, it is really interesting. Um, and how did you become interested in studying anthropology? Oh, this is a long story. I'll try to <laughs> cut it down. Um, so, uh, I was born and grew up in Ethiopia and you know, a lot of um, human evolutionary studies, uh, paleoanthropological studies uh, are from uh, Ethiopia or the findings are from Ethiopia. And, you know, you grow up hearing about all of that. Uh, and there's that influence in the background and that pride, that national pride of, you know, having these fossils. Um, and so that was something I've always kind of been interested in. But in school, you know, I did really well in science, science um, subjects. And in Ethiopia, what that means is you either go one of two routes. You either <laughs> go into medicine or engineering. And um, that's also kind of what I did. Um, I actually um, entered into med school um, right after high school. Uh, I did a year of med school. Uh, so in Ethiopia, we don't have the four-year pre-med programs. Um, we do four to five months of pre-med and then go straight into pre-clinical. So um, as I was doing that, I really felt deep down, you know, that wasn't my calling. That wasn't what I was meant to do. 
And I remember one day um, I saw this book that my grandfather had given me and it was the um, origins book. Uh, it's a really old book. It was like, you know, tattered and everything. <laughs> and I, you know, knew that like, that is a field I need to go into. And so while I was in med school, I started looking for programs in, you know, evolutionary biology or something similar. Um, and at that time, the archaeology department was launched at um, Addis Ababa University, um, where it was one of the schools um, at, that was part of our um, university system. And so I just took a leap of faith and transferred from medical school to archaeology. Um, and then from there, uh, I took uh, bio uh, bioanthropology classes and then said, okay, now this is also what I really wanted to do because it merged my two interests, study about the past and using scientific uh, methods. That's like the perfect marriage for me. Uh, and so once I was done, I decided to, you know, pursue my education further and go to grad school. So you received your first Leaky Foundation in 2014, which was a Baldwin Fellowship. Um, how did that impact your career? That was pretty impactful for me because um, when I applied to go to grad school in the U.S., um, and all international students will know this, is that you have to show some sort of funding um, that is readily available for when you move to um, the United States. And so at that time, I, I had just gotten my acceptance to the program um, and I was super excited, um, but the acceptance uh, at that time didn't include funding. And so it was basically a provisional acceptance for me because I wouldn't be able to get a visa if I didn't show funding. And so my advisor recommended, you know, like look into Leaky. Um, and when I went on, I saw a bunch of faces I knew, a lot of Ethiopians, uh, really great Ethiopian researchers uh, were featured on the page and, uh, you know, made it more accessible to me. And so I applied and I got the grant and that really cemented, you know, um, my visa process, my process of moving to the US and, you know, continuing my education. Well, you do an amazingly diverse amount of research. You split your time between, you know, you know, archaeological field sites and and primate field sites in the lab and collections all over the world. So what what exactly in all what what exactly in all does your work encompass, and how much time do you spend in each of those locations? So for my research, I've kind of taken a slightly different approach of um, usually in these kinds of studies, you'll see that people will study a time period and then different groups across that time period. Um, I decided to focus on one group and then go through time. And because of that, my um, research is actually pretty um, diverse in terms of like what I need um, what kind of data I need, what kind of places I need to go. So uh, because I'm interested in evolutionary um, history, I have to go to fossil sites. So um, paleontological sites and, you know, look for fossils. Um, and because I'm, you know, all the group I'm studying also includes living uh, monkeys, I have to also <laughs> go and look at those monkeys and, you know, do my research on that. Um, and uh, I also have to, you know, go to different museums and look for um, fossils that were already collected and analyze those. So these are kind of the three branches of my research. Um, I'd love to hear more about uh, your work at the field site in Kenya. And you've got some really amazing <laughs> pictures to share, too. Yeah, so as part of um, the program I'm in, um, NICEP, which is, I always forget the, <laughs> the full form, but it's the New York um, Consortium of Evolutionary, for Evolutionary Primatology. I'm able to work with a lot of people, you know, across um, different uh, institutes in New York. And one of those people happens to be um, Dr. Tom Plummer, who has a really great um, site in uh, Kenya that he has been working on for many years. And he invited me to go to that site uh, because it is also one of the sites where um, 
uh, one of the first fossils of uh, Therapithecus, which is the genus of Gelatus that I study, was found at. So of course I had to, you know, jump at that chance, and it was a really great experience, uh, and it's a great uh, collaboration. So, do I describe the picture? Sure. Yeah. So one of the things, you know, one of the first things we do when we go out into the field that no one really tells you is that a lot of it is walking around and searching for fossils on the surface because we, you know, we don't just pick a spot and rid and dig randomly. You actually have to survey it. Um, if you find numerous, you know, artifacts or fossils on the surface, that tells you there might be more underneath. So we, you know, spend the day, we take a little area each, we divide it into sections and we just walk around, you know, looking on the ground, um, looking for fossils. And then, and then once we find sites, so this is uh, a new site in that area called Nyanga, and it is by the shore of Lake Victoria. And this was a site where when we surveyed, we found a lot of stone tools and fossils on the surface. So we decided, okay, this seems like a promising site. Let's start, you know, our little um, excavation pit. And um, yeah, that's what one of the things we did is we, um, divided up into sections, and we started digging, looking for fossils and artifacts. And and there are other other places at that site where um, have been excavated for much longer, right? Yeah. So this is the site of Kanjera um, North, and this is a site where um, Tom and colleagues have been working for more than um, twenty years. So that uh, pit that you saw is really deep because it's been. Um, dug year after year. So that level we're on is like the 20th year level of digging. And so um, those types of sites are also really exciting because um, you can actually look at the sides and see the stratigraphy of the area um, and also join into a project that's been really well studied. And what happens when you actually find a, a fossil? So this is also something <laughs> that is, I, uh, you know, I always see movies and they always get it wrong. It's like when you find a fossil, it's like, yay, I'm gonna pick it up and take it. That's actually not what happens. Um, while we're, we're digging, if we find uh, fossils or artifacts, what we do is we actually leave them there in that layer because we have to record everything about whatever we find. So if it's a fossil, we have to number it, label it, um, take its coordinates, GPS coordinates, its depth in the pit, all of that is recorded. And that's what I was doing in that picture. And then once we've recorded everything, we start slowly um, collecting it so we can take it back to whatever home institution museums uh, are there in that country. So in the field, or I guess in the archeological field, you're, you're excavating fossils and, and analyzing them, but you also go out in the field to observe you know, wild gelatas. What, what yeah. exactly, you know, so what was you, you recently, well, I guess somewhat recently, pre-COVID <laughs> recently, yeah. um, uh, went out and were observing uh, a really interesting group. So um, one of the, you know, biggest things uh, that we uh, do when we, you know, like study these types of primates is that if you're going to look at, um, you know, a certain group, you have to look at them, you know, through time. So not just the fossils, but also, you know, um, the living uh, relatives. So um, one interesting uh, thing that has kind of started shifting in terms of the study of gelatas is that um, in the past, we really thought gelatas uh, were restricted to just, you know, one or two areas within Ethiopia. And more recently, we're seeing that their range is actually larger than we thought, meaning they're found in areas that we didn't know of before. Um, and the site that I'm uh, particularly interested in, it's um, south of the capital. Um, it's in an area called Arsiro Bay. It's a few hours away from the capital, although the roads, as you can see in that image, they're not paved. So um, they're actually really hard to get to and it takes uh you know if you calculate it with you know good roads it would have been let's say you know three or, or four hours but it took us 10 plus hours just because those roads were really bad and it was the rainy season and so the roads were 
a little treacherous. And you said you had to go out really early in the morning, right? To, to yeah, start. we had to leave really early and um, we actually had to stay um, the night in a certain place because we didn't want to drive on those roads at night. And so when we got to that location, it was really early in the morning. And so when we walked over, you know, taking the GPS coordinates that previous researchers, previous Ethiopian researchers had um, documented and we were just following that path. We were walking through people's, you know, backyards, through farmlands, just stomping around. Um, and so when we got there, it was really early and geladas usually don't get, um, they sleep on the sides of cliffs uh, in order to prevent uh, predation. Um, but then they come on top of the um, the cliff sides in order to feed. And so we were just waiting there, just sitting around. And these friendly uh, farmers from around that area actually brought us, you know, some snacks to eat because uh, they were like, you're just sitting here, might as well eat something. And, you know, Ethiopians are really known for being friendly. Uh, and they just sat around eating and talking to us about the monkeys. And it's really amazing because they've known about these monkeys for a long time, but uh, because the language, the local language is different than the national language, they had different names for them. So ah. a lot of people didn't realize that what that was what they were referring to. Uh, so we waited and waited, like I documented, you know, the GPS coordinates. Um, we took binoculars looking around and we actually stumbled on a really beautiful site of uh, which we didn't know. So on the side of these um, huge cliffs, uh, there were some beautiful waterfalls that we didn't actually know were there. Um, and so it was really a breathtaking sight. It was so beautiful. And so um, we just stood there, you know, like started looking, documenting vegetation, um, keeping a lookout just in case we see them. And our efforts were rewarded. We actually spotted first uh, a few individuals on the side of the cliff. And I was so excited that I actually ran up to the side of the cliff and was trying to, you know, peer over. And one of my colleagues and friends had to like pull me back and he was like, you're on the edge of that cliff. <laughs> and so when we saw them, you know, um, it was a really amazing sight because, you know, you hear about it, you read about it, but actually going out and seeing them was really amazing. And we saw a group of them with, uh, you know, a male leader and several females uh, that you can see in the picture um, with their infants. And they were just spending their time, you know, um, on the ground eating uh, leaves and plants that they can uh, find. So it was really amazing for us to confirm that they were there to see, um, even though this isn't a really large group in terms of geladas, if you go to the north, they actually come out in really large groups of thousands. Um, and this is actually a really small group, but it was great to conform, confirm their presence there. And your uh, the team that went out, it wasn't just scientists, right? No, it was actually a great team. Um, so uh, one of the people I um, worked with and actually really helped with this project um, is the person you can see with the scarf. Um, that is Dr. Khalil Abu. He is um, a primatologist and he's the one who really worked in this area and figured out where these geladas are, documented their number, population, and is still doing a lot of work in that area. Um, and we also had um, an acquaintance from the Ethiopian Wildlife uh, Conservation Authority who, uh, you know, usually they send representatives to escort people who, you know, do this type of work. Um, and we also had a police es escort. So when we reached the nearest town, you know, we're strangers, we're Ethiopians, but we're still strangers to that area. Um, and so um, around that time, especially a few, a year and a half or two years ago, there were some political tension in that area. So having these strangers come in, um, people don't know your intent, you know, you could be a spy, you could be, you know, and trying to take advantage of them. So 
um, uh, the people in that town actually said, you know, you should take a police escort, especially if you're going to be walking through people's farmlands and things like that. So we had a police escort and he was great because he knew the people. He was just waving like, hi, you know, like these guys are here to watch, you know, monkeys. I know they're crazy, but <laughs> that's what they're doing. But it was a really great team. Well, awesome. I'm now really excited to hear your talk. So let's um, turn over the virtual floor to you, Dag, and hear more about, you know, the evolution of gelatas and their ancestors. Great. And also for our viewers, get ready because following, we will be having a quick little quiz and we'll, be, we'll also be hearing about Dag's mentorship program at the American Museum of Natural History. So really excited about that. Okay, let me share my screen. I mean, the, the, that waterfall site, I mean, oh, I just, I wish I were there. <laughs> and, and the thing is, like, it's one thing to know it's coming, but to be surprised by that. Yeah. <laughs> I actually was joking, like, it looks like a, you know, a scene straight out of Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh, it does. Like, it looks so pretty. And um, I think one thing you had mentioned to me uh, when uh, we first talked was that when you first saw the gelatas, they were across the uh, like gorge there. Yeah. So we saw a small group across and we were so disheartened because we thought, OK, we can't cross that gorge. You saw how big it is. And yeah. to go around, it actually extends like several regions. It's not even just like that one town. So it would take days. And so we're just like trying to, you know, uh, I was trying to zoom in with my camera and we didn't even take any good pictures. And so when we, that's why I got so excited when I saw them, you know, coming up uh, from the cliffside. And yeah, it was, it was a lucky day for us, a successful day. Okay, I think, uh, yep. Well, I will see you on the other side of your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so for my talk today, I've actually decided to give a kind of broad overview of my research, but also focus in on one specific project um, within my dissertation research, uh, just to give you guys an idea of what I've been doing. And so uh, I'll be talking about um, the evolutionary history of gelada monkeys and their ancestors. And this uh, entire group um, is called uh, the genus Theropithecus. So I'll be referring to them you know, as a group um, Theropithecus. And I also want to acknowledge this really beautiful um, photograph I have of a gelada male, and it was taken by um, an amazing photographer, Jeffrey Kirby, who um, works for Nat Geo and has been so kind to provide me with um, a lot of his pictures from um, different uh, populations of geladas in Ethiopia. So thank you, Jeff. Okay, so... So one of the biggest questions I get when I talk about my research is why Theropithecus, why this group? Um, and my sarcastic answer is usually why not? <laughs> but there's actually really great reasons for why this um, whole uh, genus is a great uh, topic of research. One of the reasons is that even though um, the representative living group of Theropithecus, Theropithecus gelata or gelata monkeys, are only found in Ethiopia, so um, distributed in different populations um, in the highlands of Ethiopia. In the fossil record, um, so millions of years ago, this was actually not the case. There were actually a lot of different species distributed all over Africa and even in parts uh, outside of Africa. So we find them in North Africa, East Africa, even down to South Africa and sites. Uh, there's some fossil fragments uh, from Spain, um, Middle East, as well as even in India. So this was a unique thing for um, non-human primates around that time. Uh, and so this makes them an interesting group uh, to study. And in their distribution, something also very um, 
interesting about these uh, monkeys is that in most of the sites that these uh, fossil monkeys or fossil remains are found, they are usually found um, with uh, fossils of human ancestors, so hominin fossils. And so we know from this evidence that they shared um, habitats with our human ancestors. And so uh, learning more about these monkeys lets us figure out more about our own evolutionary history uh, as well. So that's also one big reason. So <clears throat> what do we know about um, the phylogeny of this group, meaning the evolutionary history, uh, how many groups were there, how many species? Uh, and what we know today is that there's three major lineages. Um, so uh, two major fossil lineages and one uh, living or extant uh, lineage. So we have Therapeuticus brumpti, um, which is a fossil uh, lineage, uh, Therapeuticus oswaldi, another fossil lineage, and the living uh, Therapeuticus gelada lineage. So how do we identify these uh, monkeys in the fossil records? So luckily for us, uh, Therapeuticus uh, species are actually very um, distinct and easy fairly easy to identify in the fossil record. Um, and this is because they have several features in their skulls, particularly that allow us to distinguish them. Um, particularly in their teeth, um, Therapeuticus specimens have uh, very distinct teeth, uh, especially their molars. They have really high crusty molars, as you can see in that image, because of their diet. So um, if you've seen talks about geladas in the past, even on this series, you'll know that they are, um, geladas are herbivorous um, primates that feed primarily on grass. So in order to um, ingest these and uh, really break down grass, they have specialized teeth that allows them to do this. Um, and also, in addition to that, we have different features like the temporal lines that you can see over here. They uh, actually join in the middle and form this slight triangle that you see. Um, and also their um, skulls are constricted right behind their orbits in order to allow the muscles uh, for chewing this type of food. So if we, you know, find these features in fossil specimens, we're able to identify, you know, what is a Therapeuticus um, specimen versus what is not. So for my dissertation, I know this is a lot of text, um, but I'm looking at a wide variety of questions um, in two broad categories. So I'm looking at systematics, what is uh, basically reconstructing the evolutionary tree of um, Therapeuticus, meaning you know, uh, figuring out when did they first appear in the fossil record, how many groups were there throughout uh, their evolutionary history, how are they related to each other, and uh, so forth. And also, how are the living groups related to the fossil groups? And also within the living groups, uh, are there different subspecies uh, in the different areas of Ethiopia? The second part is the paleobiology. So figuring out what was happening in the different fossil spe species of Therapeuticus. So for example, looking at their diet, uh, how has this changed if it has changed through time? Um, what does this mean in terms of their morphology, meaning the shape of their um, bodies uh, and their skulls? And also uh, answering kind of unique questions. For example, there's a, a fossil species that uh, looks very different from the rest and has a really unique look and uh, figuring out why that is. So, so, you know, a lot of questions to be answered. But for today, I figured I'd um, talk about one of these uh, questions, a small kind of part of my dissertation, uh, which I just mentioned. And so one of the questions I'm trying to answer is, what is the cause of the extreme facial morphology of this uh, species of Therapeuticus? So when we say facial morphology, it's just the shape of their um, skulls, the shape of the facial um, bones. And so Therapeuticus brumpti is a species of uh, Therapeuticus that lived uh, 3 million years uh, before present. 
um, and we find fossils of this uh, spe of this species in Eastern Africa, so parts of um, Kenya, parts of Ethiopia as well. And what is really cool about these uh, about this species is that in the in the fossil record, when we find um, the skulls of these um, species, what we see is that they have a really unique uh, face, right? When you're looking at it, they uh, have the features uh, that I mentioned earlier, but they also have their own unique features. And one of these is their cheekbone. So they have a really um, crazy looking actually cheekbone. And what we found is that this is found in mostly the male um, specimens that we're finding, the male Therapeuticus brompti, and not so much in the females. And so uh, this isn't a very surprising thing because um, within the modern living geladas, we know that there is this thing called sexual dimorphism, which means uh, the males look different than the females. Uh, so they are different in terms of their appearance, their size, uh, and their overall morphology. And so we see this in the fossil record, but this is an extreme case in particular to this um, species, Therapeuticus brumpti. And so for a long time, researchers have thought that this was due to diet, so the type of food that this group was eating at that time, so either eating really hard, harder uh, material uh, food that was causing, you know, their facial muscles to do something different or eating um, large sized foods that was causing, um, you know, that would enable them to open their mouths to a certain degree. And so that's why they have these spe specialized features. Um, so with more studies that have come out about um, their diet, um, what we found is that they actually, um, are eating similar things to what we see in modern gelada populations. And so that caused you know, me to question, okay, is it really diet that is causing this feature? Um, but, uh, or is it something different? So I tried to test the something different hypothesis. And one of my explanations would be, is it a factor of sexual selection that we're seeing um, these uh, male specimens exhibiting this feature. So as part of a larger project uh, that I am working on with my colleagues and friends uh, at NYU, um, I decided to you know, look more into this. And so previous work has been done by several um, people in our team looking at uh, what we call these uh, sexual characteristics in uh, male uh, primate groups. So. Um, a previous study had been done looking at flanging uh, in orangutan. So flanging is what you see in that image of the male orangutan having um, this extreme, uh, you know, fatty uh, face, uh, as well as uh, some other primate groups like drill monkeys that you see on the bottom here that also have that flanging characteristic. And so. Um, what uh, researchers have found is that these features are um, uh, sexually selected, meaning they're features that uh, enable the males to attract female mates and increase their reproductive success. And so what I want to know is, is this something that we're seeing um, in the Therapeuticus brompti species and in the males of Therapeuticus brompti. So I won't bore you too much with the um, details, but um, in these previous studies, um, researchers had, had identified measurements that were correlated with that having that kind of facial feature. And so I took those same measurements in uh, all the different um, species of Therapeuticus, fossil and living. Um, and you can see I actually took them from scans uh, that I had collected during my museum visits in the past. Um, and what I found is that these measurements that previous researchers had identified of indicating that kind of facial feature is something that we also see um, in uh, Therapeutica species, uh, particularly the males that are the outliers that you see in this um, bar graph. 
So what is the cause? Uh, so this is the question I wanted to answer. Um, we don't have a definite, definitive answer, uh, as is the case in most research projects, but we have more uh, evidence to support maybe the second hypothesis of um, sexual selection being the driving factor for this um, feature in their faces. So um, we uh, see this type of behavior happening in uh, fossil pigs that researchers have identified having that kind of um, weird looking um, cheekbones. Uh, is something that is seen in other groups and other fossil groups as well. So this is a probable explanation uh, for why we see this um, crazy feature in Therapeuticus brumpti male uh, specimens um, in the fossil record. So this is just to give you a little insight into some of the work that I'm doing. So I think that's all I have. So, oh, I actually have a little bit more. So how do these different um, projects come together um, or why are we working on this project? So uh, our overall goal is to take what we know um, from living primates, from fossil primates that exhibit this behavior and test hypotheses of that in uh, human evolution. So in um, different species uh, like uh, Paranthropus that you've seen that uh, image there and testing out this possible uh, hypothesis of it being uh, a feature of sexual selection um, in addition to diet or um, you know, regardless of diet. So that's something we're still working on. Uh, and hope to complete in the near future. Okay, so that's all I have. Well, thank you so much. That was really interesting. I um, it was it was really neat after having several episodes of Lunch Break Science looking at you know live gelata behavior to really look at their fossils and kind of hear more about their evolution and I just, it just was really 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 interesting um but now we are going to have a little quiz for you all okay. um let me let me I hope you're paying attention yeah 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 so um the way it's going to work is we are going to put some skulls on the screen and you will have to guess which one is a gelata so dag would you um give us a little bit of a give our viewers a little bit of background that might help them guess which one of these three skulls is a gelata. And then for our viewers, you can guess A, B, or C in the chat. So remember what I <laughs> talked about, about, uh, you know, the distinct parts of um, a gelata skull. Uh, think about um, where facial muscles uh, attach and also uh, if you are uh, or have taken an intro to bioanth class, uh, find the primate first uh, and then move on to figuring out which one is the gelada. So process of elimination would, would be of a good, good helpful. <laughs> so let's see here. Size also helps. So thinking about the size. Well, we're getting quite a few, quite a few responses now. Is there anything else that would uh, help help our viewers? Think of their faces, of the pictures of the actual living gelatas that I've been showing. So that might also help. Or Google gelata faces. <laughs> and, and I'll also mention that these these skulls are not to scale. Um, that oh, that yeah. might that might also. Help. <laughs> okay. It seems like um, let's see here. We're getting quite a few answers in. Let's see everyone's. So, Dag, what is the correct answer? The correct answer, everyone has really gotten it, is C. So, what were what were some of the other skulls? So, um, this skull is from a mouse lemur. Uh, so, it's another primate. Uh, so, it has the primate features, but as you can see, the eye uh, sockets, the orbits are really large because these mouse lemurs have really large eyes. So, that would be a good giveaway, as well as having a shorter snout uh, than what we would see in gelatas. 
And then maybe we should we oh uh, sorry but about that. Um this last this last skull that we have not identified yet um is very different from the others. Should we have a should we have a little uh, uh extra yes. credit quiz? So yeah. what, what what about this skull is different from the others? So um one of the things you can I will give a hint to is that it doesn't have a really key primate feature, which would be having uh, that little piece of bone uh, behind the eye, the orbits, uh, or having a post-orbital closure, as we call it, a bony wall behind the orbits. So this should tell you that it is not a primate. But so does anybody out there have any guess? Please, <laughs> please go ahead and, and put your guesses in the chat. So what, what else is there? The, the teeth look very interesting. The teeth are very interesting. Uh, make out the molars on the side. That would be a good hint. Also, a really good hint is the jaw. So uh, the jaw is kind of a giveaway if you can <laughs> tell. We have had uh, uh, we have had a couple of guesses. Maybe. But I, I did see that we had the right answer on there. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's a panda. So I, I really love pandas. Uh, and when I actually saw their skulls, I loved them more, uh, particularly their jaws. You can see that the front part of their jaw, um, their coronoid process is really um, tall because, you know, um, pandas primarily eat the bamboo leaves uh, and bamboo sticks. So they really need these big muscles for um, processing that. So they have, it like goes all the way towards the top of their cranium. So it's just a, a cool uh, skull that I really like looking at. And I feel like, you know, it was kind of a little trick question because it wasn't a primate at all. So <laughs> I gave that away though. So oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, I like when we first saw the lineup. But um, anyway, so um, thank you all for participating in that uh, quick quiz. But now let's hear more about the outreach you do. So, Dag, you work with the American Museum of Natural History to mentor high school students. Can you tell us more about this program? Yeah, so this is a really amazing program that I'm part of. Um, so it's part of the education department of the museum. Um, and the uh, overall goal of this um, project or this um, uh, program is to match uh, researchers within the museum. So from all the different uh, fields that are uh, you know, represented in the museum, um, to match those researchers with um, high schoolers from New York City to work on you know, research projects for a full um, academic year. Um, so researchers get matched with three or, uh, now I think it's three or four um, students. And we work on a really, full on um, scientific project. Uh, and so they can get a glimpse, a little insight into you know, what it is that scientists do and actually um, get hands-on training on how, you know, collecting data, processing, analyzing data. And they also uh, get to present on their data just like we do, right? They do talks, they do um, poster presentations. So those are, um, my students from a previous year, uh, and they're also working on gelatas. So I actually have them working on um, projects that I'm working on. So we're basically working on it together and their insight is so amazing. Like the experience they bring um, and the fresh eyes that they bring to research, you know, that I've been looking at for years. It's been a really great um, experience for me. And you, you um, they actually are working on, um mapping the skulls that you're scanning, correct? Yeah, so um, I have a really large collection of scanned data already. Um, and so they're helping me uh, do uh, landmarking, which is a process we use in order to capture the um, shape of you know an object that could be a skull any uh, type of bone um, and look at shape differences in uh, different skulls so um, this is a nice video uh, so when I go to the museums uh, museum collections what I do is I bring my trusty um, laser scanner uh, and I scan specimens so you know I can spend 
um, more time analyzing it uh, while you know I'm not at the museum, right? You can't be in different countries for a full year and you know work just on that. So this really allows me to bring the data home with me. Um, and so now I have that data. I work on it myself, but I also have um, the students through um, shrimp is what we call it. The SRMP um, work on it as well. And if you're in the New York area, we've actually shared a um, a link in the chat to the program at the American Museum. Yeah, Museums I think because... it's still open. I'm sorry if it's not, but look into it um, for yeah. future um, years. I'm working. I actually invited my current uh, shrimps, uh, my students, uh, to this talk. Hopefully uh, they're um, watching. But um, I'm still working on a project with them. Um, and, you know, now we've had to go virtual because of, uh, you know, COVID, but it's really just a really great experience. So please check it out. And then beyond, um, beyond your research, you also have a kind of dream project, you know, for your future. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, being part of this program um, in New York has really made me think about, um, you know, the whole infrastructure um, in Ethiopia, which is, you know, my home country. Um, and it has made me, you know, really think about um, doing similar pro projects or similar programs at the National Museum in Ethiopia, because um, the museum is really great. Um, in addition to just the uh, exhibit part of the museum, there's a huge research facility um, called the ARCCH. It's uh, part of the Authority for Research and Conservation of Cultural Heritage. So um, we have a really great setup there, really great minds. Uh, most of my undergrad um, classmates uh, currently work there and do research there. Uh, any researcher, you know, who does human evolutionary study um, in Ethiopia has gone through that research facility. And I think there's so much more potential to reach younger um, Ethiopians um, and, you know, show them the possibility of this research. Uh, because, you know, they always, as a kid, we take school trips or you take trips to the museum and you'd see all these amazing findings from Ethiopia. But it really doesn't occur to you for some reason, uh, I'll, I'll make it personal, it didn't occur to me that I could, you know, study this, I could do this, I could follow, you know, this passion and actually translate it into, you know, a career. And so that's something I really want to work on. And uh, I have hope that it was something that can really become a reality. I feel like we have enough, you know, researchers now to start working on it, because it's been amazing to see all the previous, you know, Ethiopian researchers that have been featured. They're all like my heroes and collaborators in uh, some way. So um, that is a dream of mine. Well, it's really exciting to hear about and we'll definitely, you know, as you as you work on developing it, let you know, keep us keep us posted and maybe you can come back and give us an update. <laughs> I will, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Well, now it's time to take some questions from the audience. So if you're watching live, get those questions into the chat right now. And we'll take our first question. Um, I was lucky enough to see gelatas in the simians a few years ago, but they were called gelata baboons then. Is that a term no longer used? So that is a term we use colloquially. Um, in the past, they were called gelato baboons because they were, look really similar to baboons and people thought that they were baboons, but now we know they're a sister group to baboons. So I just usually don't use it to avoid the confusion. Um, and that's the only reason. So we know that they're not baboons. So they're their own specific group that are sister, um, you know, uh, sister group to uh, baboons. So that's why I usually try not to use it, uh, but I don't fault anyone for using it. It's just when you um, think of them, you know, in a scientific sense, um, we just try to separate them and create that separation from baboons. Well, that, that makes up, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's get our next question. Uh, how does non-human primate wanderlust compare with other mammals? I actually think 
I, I feel like there's this sense of the grass is greener because I always look at, uh, you know, pe other uh, paleontologists who study, you know, other mammals that and think, ah, oh, they're doing something so cool, <laughs> you know, like have that. Um, but I think like there's so much similarity in the methods we use um, and the questions we're asking. So I feel like there's a lot of overlap, but I do have a little sense of envy for <laughs> people who do, you know, other uh, types of paleontology. If, if you could study another animal, what would you study? Would it be, would it be the pandas? <laughs> oh my god uh, let me think ah, I, I can't I'm like I don't know why I'm blanking it's not like I've never thought about it um, I've always been interested you know I think this is kind of cliche but um, in uh, mammoths and you know um, elephant uh, ancestors and things like that so maybe larger mammal uh, studies would be something <laughs> I would be interested in well th I that sounds that sounds really cool to me uh, let's take another question is there a hypothesis as to why Terrapithecus went extinct elsewhere and is only found currently in Ethiopia yeah, so there's uh, a number of different hypotheses. Some, uh, most of them agree. Uh, and one of the things is, um, you know, the change in environments due to a change in the climate. So um, their success is, or the things that made them so successful at that time is actually also what caused their downfall because um, they were able to exploit um, open areas and, you know, uh, not a lot of primates uh, eat grass or, you know, these types of plants. Uh, most primates are reliant on uh, tree uh, products, right? Products that we get from trees like fruits. And so um, at that time, they were able to go into areas that other primates, so when I say primates, I'm leaving humans out of it. So non-human primates uh, weren't able to get to and exploit those areas and really thrive. Um, but then when the um, uh, climate changed and we also see like an uptick in the amount of uh, other grazers in that area, um, they weren't able to compete with them. And also they were so limited in their diet because they became really specialized in eating those things. And so they couldn't adapt to that changing environment. And so that's what we think caused their extinction in the different parts and kind of drove them to the highlands of Ethiopia. And we, and, uh, you know, uh, Therapeuticus or Gelatas are not uh, an exception to, you know, the rule. There's actually a lot of examples of animals, you know, becoming endemic to one area where they had been, you know, really uh, spread out in other areas. But in terms of primates, their um, spread is actually pretty unique. We should, I think we have a follow-up question too for that one. Um, are there terpenicus fossils fragments found in India, Spain, and Mil and Middle East in highland locations? So the locations uh, aren't uh, all highlands now. So um, we believe that the highland uh, being in these highland locations is actually a gelada and not a Therapeuticus, uh, you know, characteristic. Uh, so in these other areas, they're found in deserts and things like that, where they used to be, you know, open grasslands. So they're not really in the highlands. Oh, okay. Um, how old are the first fossils of the Terrapithecus John? <laughs> um, so we have... Uh, fossils dating uh, up to 4, 4.2, 4.3 million years ago. So we believe it could also extend to 5 million years ago. Just, and as always, just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So um, the oldest we found is in the 4 millions, but uh, there could always be older. And our next question we have, uh, ah, this is from... Um, it is your advisor, <laughs> Eric Delson. Well, why do you think that the uh, from from uh, disappeared while the Oswaldi group hung on after half a million years ago? Um, so basically, um, 
the areas that um, Brumpty uh, was found was also very limited and Oswaldi was more um, spread out. So that lineage or the species within that lineage. Um, and so when these environmental changes happened, um, it di didn't affect Oswaldi as much and uh, they were able to adapt uh, a little bit more than uh, Brumpty in terms of, you know, um, their feeding and uh, their feeding habits and such. So what, what were what were the differences between the two for those of us that don't know those? So um, I would love to have two skulls, but um, in terms of, you know, their, um, their skulls, they had a lot of differences in terms of their, the size of their teeth, um, the size of their mandibles, um, even the features that I mentioned in the cheekbones uh, as well. Uh, and we see also some slightly different um, features in their uh, postcrania, so not just the skull, but in the um, rest of the body as well. We have another, ah, okay. Um, are gelatas unique as a terrestrial monkey or a, uh, along with humans? We always make a big deal about humans leaving the trees. So gelatas aren't uni unique as a terrestrial monkey because baboons are also pretty uh, terrestrial. And nowadays baboons are kind of in the opposite trend of them not being as prolific in the past, but now they actually have a really a wider distribution than what we see in gelatas because they're found in different parts of Africa and different countries um, and different regions. Uh, so terrestriality isn't um, that unique, but the amount of terrestriality uh, in gelatas is probably the most other than humans because they live in areas where there's almost no trees. So I don't know if in my pictures, even if you saw um, uh, the areas, there's not a lot of trees. It's just open, either grasslands or farmlands. Um, and they usually spend most of their time, you know, on these open grasslands and really have, uh, don't go, you know, in the trees or near trees uh, a lot of the time. So that's pretty unique. Uh, but baboons also are uh, very terrestrial. Uh, and that kind of, you know, uh, I know we talk about like in terms of human evolution of, you know, the uh, kind of uh, stereotype of walking down or we got down from the trees and started walking, which I'm sure most uh, paleoanthropologists have come on here and said it's, that's not like the <laughs> exact picture. Um, but their terrestriality is why we find them in these uh, fossil hominin sites as well, because uh, humans were also living in more uh, open areas, and these monkeys were one of the few that were able to also live in those areas. Well, we're going to quickly try to get in two more questions. Let's see here. We have, uh, in terms of sexual selection, is there something other male feature than in the face that in combination is attractive to gelato females, except for example, scent. So there are other um, things and markers of, uh, you know, sexual selection in gelato is one of the biggest or obvious ones is their chest patch. So, you know, I didn't talk too much about the modern gelatas because I wanted to emphasize the fossils, but gelatas, they're also called the bleeding heart monkeys because they have a naked patch of chest, uh, a naked patch uh, on their chests. Um, and in the males, um, that patch changes color. So um, when the patch is more bright red, um, it shows uh, that the male is healthy and dominant. Um, and in, in addition to um, showing other males kind of like a don't mess with me vibe that I'm dominant, it also um, acts as, you know, something attractive for females to know this is a dominant, healthy male. Uh, but I'm not too, you know, uh, familiar or in depth. Uh, I don't have too much in depth knowledge in uh, these uh, types of behaviors. Uh, just because I'm more focused, you know, on the morphology, which is the bones, the skeletal structures, and the shape. Um, but that's one I kind of know off the top of my head. But I'm sure there's more. Well, well it sounds like a good topic for um, another Lunch Break Science episode. I know. Uh, we we have have a lot, there's a lot of great people working on this. And yeah. uh, another slight, not dream, but a goal of mine is to kind of, you know, 
um, have this collaboration of all the researchers that you know study geladas, and there is right now. I know they there's a lot of collaboration going on um, with people who uh, you know work at these different sites, but. Uh, I also want to incorporate, you know, the fossil uh, stuff with that too, uh, and I think that's not, that's not a dream. I think that's something that will be happening very soon. Good, good, good. So we have our last question. Do you feel getting into bioanth programs are more accessible now than before? I do. I don't think it's like the best situation ever, but I think it's much more um, accessible than it has been in the past. Um, and especially just seeing, you know, more diverse faces um, shows you that, okay, you know, if she can do it, that's something I can do. And more programs are really leaning into this kind of work of, you know, making their programs accessible. I know a lot of grad school programs are thinking about, you know, dropping things like the GRE or financial requirements that would restrain a large, you know, number of students from pursuing these fields. So I think it is becoming more accessible, but I also think we have a really long way to go. And, you know, that's why we're here. <laughs> I feel like we are the future, right? And we're trying to make this feel better. And I'm, and we're also walking in the path of people who have been doing the work. So uh, I do think it's become more accessible, but I also think we have a lot of work to do. Well, Dag, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful episode. Thank you so much for being on Lunch Break Science. Thank you so much. You can visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, Dag Mawit Getun, as well as how you can help support research like Dag's and educational programs like Lunch Break Science. Right now, all donations will be doubled by two generous donors, meaning your impact will be doubled. On March 4th, in just two weeks, we meet Leaky Foundation scientist Naomi Cleghorn and learn about her work investigating how humans responded to the changing landscape of the early, later Stone Age in South Africa. Still hungry for science and can't wait till March 4th? Check out the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, Origin Stories, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about upcoming episodes, events, as well as groundbreaking research in the field of human evolution. Lunch Break Science is made possible by the generous support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith. Thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge.